you, Flo. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today in this uh, workshop in which we will be showing you how to integrate Cardo frames into your spatial data science workflows. Uh, well, uh, Flo already introduced us. So we are Miguel Alvarez and Julia Carella. And um, uh, today's workshop is going to have two parts. In the first part, we will give you a brief uh, overview of uh, the analytical capabilities of uh, Cardo frames. And in the second part, we will be uh, we will walk you through two different use cases. Uh, well, you'll have the chance to see how Cardo frames can actually help you uh, working on on your spatial data analysis. One, uh, the first one will be run by Julia. The second one uh, by me. Okay, so uh, I guess most of you know that uh, well. Carter's goal is to help you turn your location data uh, into business outcomes, and as such. Uh, one of our key products is uh, Cardo Frames, which is a Python library, which was originally designed by a, a data scientist here at Cardo uh, for other data scientists to facilitate, uh, let's say, our spatial data analysis workflows. OK, and why uh, Cardo Frames? So why we felt there was a need for, for this type of products? Uh, well, because of two main things. Uh, on one side, uh, we identified that during the work we do when we work with uh, geospatial data and ge uh, spatial data analysis in general, um, there is a lot of, um, or there used to be a lot of context switching. So you start working on a Jupyter notebook with your Python code. And then, uh, for example, you need to, uh, to calculate a geo, um, uh, so you, you need to geocode your, your data and you switch to another context. And then, for example, you need to enrich your data with external data from uh, from other providers, and you have to go to yet another uh, another context, another platform. Uh, so we wanted to have everything uh, everything together into one library that allow you to uh, do all that work uh, within a Jupyter notebook. On 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 the other hand, uh, the other the other thing that we also found that um, needed some help was uh, regarding the time we spend on data preparation and data analysis. This is something, I think, general uh, to the data science community. But especially when you work with uh, geospatial data, there's, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, preparing data. Uh, and it's estimated that around 80% of our time is spent in preparing that data and only 20% uh, on doing the actual analysis. So the goal uh, of uh, with Cardo Frames, the goal we have is to um, well, to, to change these percentages so that uh, we can actually spend most of our time on, on doing the, the analysis. And how does Carter Frame do this? Well, by, by powering end-to-end -end, uh, data science workflows and uh, from, from the beginning to, to the end. So uh, as you'll see on the, on the two use cases that we'll walk you through in a minute, you'll see that Carter Frames is present all along the way, okay? From the exploration part to later enrichment to the analysis part and finally to sharing the results that you get with uh, your management, with uh, uh, clients, with your colleagues and, and so forth. And how does specifically, so how, how does Carter work? So uh, in terms of exploration, uh, well, Carter, uh, Carter Frames allows you to manage your own data. Uh, it can be on your Carter account and, or if you don't have a Carter account, you can just load data uh, from your local computer in different formats. It also allows you to, uh, to get your data ready by geocoding large data sets and calculating isochrons uh, in just one request. This is something very powerful because, again, this reduces the time uh, you need to prepare your data. And of course, uh, in terms of exploration, uh, well, Carter Frames is a very powerful visualization tool. Um, it allows you to uh, map multiple layers. It has a lot of styling options. Uh, custom base maps, uh, and then you can add to your map legends, uh, widgets, uh, pop-ups, and so forth, so, you, so that you can build very powerful visualizations, like the one you have there, uh, that allow you to make um, very, very um, specific and deep analysis on, on your data from, uh, from a, a spatial point of view. Then in terms of uh, enrichment, uh, I think yesterday on the chat, uh, there, there were already some conversations regarding Cardo Data Observatory. Uh, data, uh, uh, so Cardo Data Observatory is, uh, is our data catalog. 
It's a data catalog that has more than 7,000 uh, data sets, both public and, and premium. And uh, the powerful thing about the data observatory is that it brings uh, high quality and curated data sets uh, that allow you to reduce the time to insights. So basically, uh, Card of Frames gives you direct access to these uh, data sets. Um, and the most important thing is that these data sets have been assessed, its quality has been assessed by us so that uh, you can be sure that you can uh, directly use this data and uh, enrich your data sets and, and start analyzing uh, your data with all this. As you can see, we have uh, several uh, categories. Uh, you can find financial data, points of interest, road traffic, and, and so forth. So uh, as I was saying, um, well, Card of Frames gives you direct access to, to the data observatory. Uh, and uh, well, the, the data observatory is organized by, uh, by category, by country, by geography and provider, so that it is very easy to explore the whole catalog. So you can start, you can start from the top, from the whole data catalog, and then you can start filtering. For example, your analysis may be only focused on, on the UK, so you only want data from the UK, and then you might be interested only in demographics or points of interest, so you can start filtering until you find the right data sets for you. And also, very interestingly, uh, we not only give you access to, to this data, we also provide information of the data set so that, for example, you can have uh, uh, some stats, uh, some stats summary about, your, uh, about the different data sets. You can also have a, a, a first glimpse of the data set by, by having a look at the 10 first rows. You can also have access to the metadata. Uh, to the metadata. So in the end, uh, we want you. Uh, we want to make sure that once you decide that this is the the data set that you were looking for, that's exactly the one that you need. Or even if you don't know, you're just working on an analysis and you know you need external data, but you don't know exactly uh, what data sets you need. Uh, well, uh, the fact that the card of frames allows you to explore the data catalog this easily. Uh, will allows you to explore different data sets, see and see what can be interesting for, for your analysis. Then in terms of uh, the analysis part, uh, we're currently working on, um, on, on extending the, the analytical capabilities of card of frames in two ways to keep reducing the time uh, of data preparation and we're also working on making complex uh, spatial analysis easily accessible. So we are working, for example, on providing uh, one of the uh, on providing, for example, spatial clustering, which is um, a use case that we find a lot in in our clients. Uh, and, and normally, it's hard to know all the libraries that you need to use in order to build a proper uh, and, and in order to perform a proper uh, spatial clustering. So we are working on making this uh, easily accessible and leveraging cloud capabilities so that uh, the, the size of your data is not, is, not, uh, is not a problem, let's say. And finally, as the, uh, the last part, of course, uh, as we said already in the, in the, ex uh, in the exploration part, uh, well, Card of Frames, allows you to, uh, to make very powerful visualizations. And with this, well, once you have the results of your analysis, you can build very uh, interesting um, dashboards. Then later, you can publish and you can get an URL so that you don't need to share the notebook with uh, management and, and your client. Uh, basically, you just have that URL that you can share with uh, different people so that they can uh, they can uh, explore the, the insights that, that you got, okay? And this is basically uh, the, the, the overview we wanted to give you about uh, Card of Frames. Uh, now we'll jump into, into the two use cases where you'll see all these four parts uh, in practice. Uh, we'll see two different uh, use cases, as I mentioned before. The first one, which will be uh, led by uh, Julia, and she will try to answer the question where should a Starbucks open new coffee shops in Long Island, New York? And on the second one, I will try to answer the question, where should a parcel delivery company locate their uh, distribution and fulfillment centers? So with this, I let Julia go on. Thanks, Miguel. So let me share my screen. All right, so... Um... 
all the material for uh, the workshop uh, can be find can be found in a, a repository on github um, which uh, is this one we can uh, share the the link uh, through the chat uh, or through slack um, afterwards um, you can see that there are two different folders uh, uh, that um, correspond to different uh, um, to, to, the, to the two different uh, uh, use cases. Um, to run the um, to, to run these uh, uh, notebooks, so you will need uh, a Carto account, um, and uh, um, in particular, you need to know your username and API key. Um, so let's jump uh, to the first use case that, as Miguel uh, was uh, um, was um, uh, anticipating, is about site selection. Um, for those of you who don't know what site selection refers to, um, this um, is intended uh, as uh, the process of opening or relocating an existing store by comparing uh, the merits of potential locations. So um, it's a typical spatial analysis that uh, also requires spatial data. Um, the specific use case would be that of uh, Starbucks wanting to uh, open or relocate uh, new uh, coffee shops. Uh, in Long Island, New York. So we're gonna start uh, uh, by reading and uh, uploading uh, um, the um, uh, revenue data from Starbucks uh, to, to Carto. Uh, we're gonna then geocode uh, the, the locations um, to transform the address uh, uh, lines to longitude and latitude pairs. Um, we're gonna then download the data that we're gonna need for our revenue model from uh, Carto's data observatory. In particular, we're gonna use census data. Um, and then we're gonna build the predictive model and um, publish a visualization with the results. Um, if you want to uh, um, run the, the notebook, uh, um, you need to um, set up your environment. Uh, we recommend uh, to uh, use a virtual environment uh, in order to avoid any conflict with existing libraries. Uh, and um, you need to import the libraries that are listed in the uh, requirements uh, file. Um, so as I was saying, you will need uh, a Carto account, specifically the username and the API key that you will need to uh, enter here in this uh, cell. Uh, so we're going to start uploading uh, the uh, revenue data to your cart account. The revenue data are stored in the uh, repository uh, here. Uh, you can see that we have uh, the uh, address lines uh, and then uh, some uh, other uh, fields, but uh, the one that we're interested in here is the revenue. Uh, we can start by looking at the distribution of the revenues, which uh, is always positive. Um, and uh, is distributed in this way. Um, the next step is about um, transforming uh, this data frame into a geo data frame. And by doing that, we need to geocode the location, which is mm, translating the address uh, lines into longitude and latitude pairs. To do that, we can use Carter frames, in particular the geocoding class, which is um, um, called here. Um, we need to pass to the geocode the, uh, the data frame uh, that is, in this case is called stores. Uh, and um, if you run this cell, what you get is a message that says success, data geocoded correctly. Um, and once you've done that, you can uh, upload uh, again using Carto frames uh, with this function to Carto. Um, your uh, data to a table uh, in Carto that uh, here we have called Starbucks uh, Long Island Geocoded. And you will see a message that says uh, success data uploaded to table uh, Starbucks uh, Long Island Geocoded. Um, once we've done that, we can visualize the data again using Carto frames, in this case using the uh, map uh, function. Um, you can look at the specifics of uh, how uh, the visualization in Carto frames work by uh, looking at the developer page. Uh, we're gonna share the link uh, afterwards. If you're interested there, you can find all the possible styles um, that you can use, uh, the legends, uh, widgets, uh, pop-ups, uh, and so on. Here we're using um, a style called uh, size bins uh, style. Um, that allows you to create maps like this, where you have the locations of the stores and uh, um, a dot with a size that corresponds 
uh, to um, a, a revenue uh, range. Um, you can see it, this is an interactive map, so you can zoom in, zoom out, and then uh, go over each uh, dot to um, see what uh, the revenue is. Uh, the next step is to get the covariates of our model. In this case, we said we're going to use uh, census data. Uh, so, um, in order to do that, we need to first specify where do we want this uh, census data. We said we're going to be we're interested in the um, area in uh, uh, Long Island. Uh, in the repository, you find you can find um, um, a GeoJSON uh, where uh, it's uh, stored uh, the um, the geometry for for Long Island that we can read uh, and then map again with Carto frames. And this is what you see here. Um, so once we have defined the area that we are interested in, where we want uh, the census data, um, we start exploring the catalog in the data observatory, uh, again using Carto frames. Um, so we uh, can specify first the country that we are interested in, in this case is the US. And by uh, running this command, we can uh, look at all the different categories that are available. Um, we're interested in demographics here. Uh, so we can then uh, further specify the category and then find which are the different providers uh, that are available. Here we're going to use uh, um, the uh, American Community Survey data uh, that uh, are freely available. Um, and um, we, we, can, we can look at the different data sets that are available from this provider using um, uh, these other uh, commands by specifying uh, the, the provider. We can see that we have different data sets that correspond to different support, uh, um, spatial supports. Uh, the finest uh, support uh, is um, the census uh, block group uh, uh, support. So we're going to select uh, that. Um, and uh, um, we can then list all the different uh, uh, tables associated to that particular data set. Um, that corresponds to different survey years. Uh, here we're going to use the most recent survey, which is the one between 2013 and 2017. And um, we can uh, look uh, by using the function dataset.get um, at all the different um, uh, specifics of this data set. Uh, the name, the description, um, the temporal aggregation, the time coverage, if it's public or not, and, and so on. Um, we can do the same thing for the um, table uh, storing the um, geometries, in this case, the census block group geometries, um, which is what we are doing here uh, with the method uh, geography.get. Um, finally, we can download uh, this data uh, using uh, um, a query um, and uh, store uh, the data in a in geo data frame. Um, which is what you see here. So you see that you have the GeoID corresponding to a census block group, all the uh, census uh, uh, variables, and then finally a column with the geometry. Uh, we can visualize the data uh, here, again, using Carto frames. Um, and uh, this uh, ends the um, ETL part. Um, as, you, as you can notice, um, we have uh, consistently reduced the time spent on data um, access uh, and preparation, which is uh, something very tedious uh, to do usually by uh, using Carto frames to um, explore the catalog and then uh, access uh, uh, the data. So once uh, all this um, uh, part is, is over, we can concentrate on the model, which is the um, most interesting thing from a data scientist point of view. Um, so we're going to start looking at the uh, covariates data, the census data, and um, deal with some uh, aspects of, of the data um, that could uh, hamper the, um, the, um, the model uh, of the revenue. Uh, first of all, we have to uh, consider the fact that um, the census data uh, represents, uh, as you can see from uh, this map here, uh, different areas. Uh, some of these areas are larger than others, uh, and they represent a different population. Um, so um, the, the variables that are extensive, for example, like um, the number of uh, males between 18 and 19, um, and by extensive variables, I mean those for which um, 
a block can be viewed as a sum of uh, uh, sub uh, uh, block values um, need to be normalized. You can normalize it by the total area or by the total population. Here we are normalizing uh, the data um, that, um, that corresponds to extensive variables by the total population. Um, to do that, we need to access which is the uh, aggregation method in order to understand if a variable is extensive or not. And we can do that again uh, by reading a Carto table here. Um, and um, you will see that you can find, uh, you can create a data set with the um, column name and the corresponding aggregation method. So we can see that all these uh, first five columns uh, uh, variables uh, are extensive variables because their uh, aggregation method is listed at sum. So we uh, compute the densities with respect to the total population for the extensive variables. Um, then we look in um, if there are any missing data. Um, we can uh, plot a, a matrix uh, showing uh, the, um, the number of, of missing data per variable. You can see that there are not um, a lot, but um, only a few variables have some missing data. But still, mm, there are missing data. And then we can check the pairwise correlation. So we can see that, um, uh, as expected, uh, by drawing the correlation metric, uh, um, most of the census uh, 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 variables are correlated. Uh, and when uh, thinking about the model, uh, this can be important. Um, so um, in order to um, um, account for missing values and um, the correlations between the data, uh, the, the census data, and also to reduce the model dimensionality, um, we um, decided to uh, use um, principal component analysis to pre-process the covariates uh, and to extract uh, the uh, constructs that, uh, explained, uh, that explain most uh, of the variance. Um, we are gonna use in particular a probabilistic formulation of principal component analysis that also allows to reconstruct uh, missing data. Um, you can call this method here, and you can see that you will get, um, as a result, a data frame uh, with the original variables, but also with uh, all the principal component scores. Uh, we can plot the uh, explained variance, uh, the cumulative explained variance, and then um, look at the uh, correlations between each principal component construct and uh, the um, original variables. Um, we can also uh, create a map uh, of these principal component scores. For example, um, here, uh, what you see is a map of the first principal component score, um, which we can see is uh, negatively correlated with the density of owner-occupied uh, housing units, but positively correlated, uh, sorry, positively correlated with the density of owner-occupied housing units, but negatively correlated with the density of uh, renter-occupied housing units. Um, finally, uh, we can select only um, a, a subset of uh, these uh, principal component scores um, in order to reduce the, the dimensionality of, of the model. Here we're going to select uh, uh, the number of uh, principal component scores that explain up to 80% of the variance uh, that um, corresponds to about 66 uh, variables. Uh, so the final um, data set uh, that you can see uh, here is a data set where we have uh, associated the original store locations uh, with the corresponding uh, census data from uh, the uh, respective uh, uh, census block group. Uh, and um, for those uh, census uh, data, we have extracted uh, the uh, principal component constructs that explain 80% of the variance. So now we, we are ready to implement the model. In this case, we're going to use a first a generalized uh, linear model. Um, uh, the, the, the likelihood selected here is a gamma likelihood to take into account the fact that the revenue is always positive. Uh, we're going to run the model here. And this is where you see uh, the, the, the model results. Um, so uh, we can um, look at how the model is uh, performing in terms of the accuracy um, um, estimated as the pseudo R2 square. 
uh, and also plotting the um, predicted uh, against the observed uh, values. Uh, we can see that uh, the model is uh, doing uh, well. Um, we can also uh, have a look at the performance by splitting the data into a train and a test data set. Um, we can see that although in the um, test, sorry, this is a testing uh, pseudo R2, uh, in the testing pseudo R2 score, uh, the score is um, um, a bit lower, we're still getting uh, good results. Um, finally, um, we can predict um, using this model um, the revenue by census block group. Um, so um, this is where we predict the revenue and we can upload then the data to, to Carto, again, using Carto frames, in this case, to a new table, and finally visualize the results. So this will be uh, the final visualization um, that uh, we have created, um, where you can see for each uh, block group, uh, the uh, predicted revenue um, overlaid. You can see the existing stores with their uh, revenue uh, range. And you can also see uh, that uh, there is a, a widget uh, showing the distribution of the predicted revenue that we can use to filter the data. For example, this would show the only a, a selection of, of the predictions. Um, so we can use this map to decide uh, which uh, are the census block groups that um, where we expect the highest revenue. According to this model, that seems to work uh, uh, quite well. And we can finally share um, uh, our results uh, by using the uh, publish uh, method from uh, Carta Frames. You can see that this method uh, creates a um, URL uh, that uh, can be then uh, shared uh, with uh, uh, your uh, manager, your client, uh, uh, that will show uh, this map here. Um, so um, we, we can try to improve uh, the model. Uh, I'm going to go very quick, uh, quickly on, the, on this part. Um, by by, seeing, by mm, accounting for any residual spatial variability, um, how can we see if we can improve the model uh, by uh, accounting for this uh, residual spatial variability? Well, uh, we can start by looking at the uh, model residuals, which are the difference between the um, observed uh, and predicted uh, revenue data, and see if we can see any spatial autocorrelation in the residuals. Um, uh, a way to do that is to use semivariograms, um, which is what we're doing here. Uh, a semivariogram uh, plots the semivariance as a function of uh, the distance. Uh, and uh, you can also fit uh, a semivariogram model through these uh, empirical points um, and uh, obtain um, the, the semivariogram par parameters, which will give you an idea, for example, of the range of the spatial uh, autocorrelation and the strength. So um, you can see that here the semivariance is increasing with, uh, uh, the, um, with the distance um, up to a point uh, where uh, the semivariogram uh, goes uh, flat. So we can, say, we can see that there is some residual spatial autocorrelation that, um, if uh, taken into account, uh, could actually um, improve the model predictions. Um, so uh, one way to do that is to fit a Gaussian process uh, generalized linear model, which is what you will see uh, in the last uh, uh, part uh, of, the, uh, of the notebook. Um, um, here, uh, we're going to use um, a, a programming language called STAN uh, to do that. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, um, you can have a look at the, at the notebook, uh, which uh, contains uh, more details uh, about that. Um, and But if we visualize the result uh, of this model, um, which um, are shown here, again, we can see that, um, that the model is, is doing well, but what about any residual uh, spatial uh, autocorrelation? Again, we can use a semivariogram to plot that. And we can see that. Um, we have improved uh, a lot uh, the autocorrelation in the residuals. Uh, if you compare this semivariogram to the one above, you could see that uh, the, um, uh, the y-axis uh, is, is very different and the, the, the semivariance values 
after accounting for the residual spatial autocorrelation uh, at, uh, are much uh, smaller. Um, of course, you would like to use this model also to extrapolate uh, and predict um, everywhere else in Long Island. Um, however, these models are very computationally expensive, so there are ways to do that, but uh, this goes beyond the scope of this uh, uh, specific exercise. Um, so, um, I hope that um, you could appreciate uh, all the different steps where uh, Carto frames and Carto could help you in this specific analysis. And if you have any questions, uh, uh, please um, reach me in the chat or um, Miguel. Um, so, thank you. Okay. Uh, so now let's try to answer the question, where should a parcel delivery company uh, locate their distribution centers? Uh, well, this use case is based on, on uh, a real work that a real project that we worked on here at Cardo um, in which, uh, well, we had a, a client that uh, well, was already established in Spain. They already had several distribution centers. They already had historical data of orders uh, from, from previous years. And um, well, they, they were interested in knowing, uh, well, first thing, if the uh, supply chain network was uh, optimally designed, which basically they wanted to know if uh, distribution centers are close enough to high density areas and, and how they could improve that. If they should close some of those distribution centers, if they should open uh, some new ones, for example. Um, and that's uh, what we are gonna be, uh, looking uh, now. Okay, so uh, as, as, I, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, we are going to be working with uh, data uh, representing what the client would have uh, uh, given us, which is uh, the location of the distribution centers, uh, the, the operational areas, and, and the historical data from the orders. And then we'll see uh, different steps of analyzing that, uh, so the, 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 their current network so that we can improve uh, their, their, uh, their design, okay? So, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I, I'm not stopping here because uh, Julia already explained this. Uh, again, you can, you can find all the, all the instructions on the GitHub uh, link. Uh, if, if you don't have it, just ask for it on the chat and someone from, uh, from my team will, will share it with you. Uh, so, Again, as I was saying, uh, we start from the locations of the distribution centers. Here, what we can see is where they have their current distribution centers uh, in Spain, and they are uh, they are plotted with a size proportional to to the weekly capacity, so the, the number of orders that they can process per week. They also provided us with information regarding their um, operational areas, which basically are the areas uh, that each of the di different distribution centers uh, deliver to, okay? There are, as, as you can see, there are some areas that are covered by two different uh, distribution centers, but in general, there is one per, uh, per area. And finally, uh, they also provided us with a whole year of uh, orders. Uh, as you can see here on the time series, uh, well, we, we just plotted the, the whole year of orders to, to see if, uh, well, to, to see if there was some pattern, some interesting pattern that we could, that we, that we could use for, for the analysis. Uh, we were specifically interested in uh, identifying and analyzing any uh, spatial patterns. So apart from the time, uh, from the temporal analysis, we also performed some spatial analysis. For example, here we are seeing a heat map of all the all the orders that they received in in a year, and well, we can see that all the all the heat all the hot spots are located where uh, well, where where people concentrate in in Spain. So it, it makes uh, quite a lot of sense. More interestingly, is uh, well, we can perform with a layout um, a layout which is a, a Cardo Frames class that allows you to plot two or more maps together so that you can compare, uh, for example, some, uh, some results that we can have here. Uh, when performing this spatial temporal analysis, what we could see, for example, if we look at the area around Madrid, we compared uh, the orders uh, processed in February and the orders processed in August, and we can see that the map in, uh, in, in winter is darker than in August. 
uh, which makes uh, which makes sense. And then if we go to the coast, for example, to the area around the city of uh, Valencia, we can see that it's the other way around. So we can find darker colors in summer than in, in winter, which again, it also makes, sound, uh, makes sense because of tourism and, and so forth. And based on this insight that we can get from this spatial temporal analysis, what we did was, well, to split all the operation and areas into those that are in the coast, located in the coast, and those that are located inside, let's say, in the inner area of Spain. And we could uh, identify this very big difference in, in the pattern, in, in the order of patterns um, and during summer months, which uh, was uh, a very interesting uh, pattern to identify. So this this was uh, the first step that we that we made. So uh, based on the data that uh, this client provided us with, we made a, an initial analysis of what the data looked like and and what we can we could infer from it. The second step was uh, to make a supply demand matching. So basically, here what we wanted to do with this analysis was to identify where the demand uh, concentrate and if for every area of high concentration of orders, there is a distribution center close to it. And if every distribution center is located close to a high uh, density area. For doing this, we applied uh, a DB scan algorithm uh, to identify the high density areas. Um, and well, the result is what you can see on the map. In purple, uh, you can see all the orders uh, that fall within a low density area. And then the rest of the colors are high density areas. In gray, we have the secondary um, density areas and the rest of the colors are most important. So because they concentrate a larger number of orders. So you can see, for example, uh, well, things that make sense, uh, the area around the city of Madrid, the area around the city of Barcelona. And then we can see different spatial patterns uh, that are also interesting. For example, uh, the orders around the city of Madrid concentrate, um, are, are quite compact and, and rounded around the city. Well, for example, around the city of Malaga or uh, Alicante, they, they are, um, the area goes all along the coast. So these are all interesting patterns that, um, that you can get. As you can see uh, here also on this uh, dashboard, we also have some metrics. Uh, for example, uh, we have the average distance from, from the distribution center to the, to the order location. Uh, we can add, for example, here we can see all the, all the distribution centers order by the number of orders uh, that they have assigned. For example, if we filter by Malaga here in the south, well, this is all the area that they would cover. And then most importantly, for example, here we might be interested in knowing, okay, I know that the average uh, distance is 20 kilometers, but I want to know how many orders fall uh, further than 50 kilometers from their closest distribution center. And this is what we are seeing here. Uh, this map is very interesting because uh, most of the areas are low density areas, which makes sense. Uh, I don't want to place a distribution center here if uh, I, I have very low demand. But we get that this area here, it's, which is quite large, has um, it, it's a high density area, which is which falls more than 50 kilometers far from the closest distribution center, and a small uh, high concentration area here as well. So. By doing this, we already have a very interesting insight that we should um, explore further, okay? So we'll keep this in mind um, as we keep continuing. As you can see, this dashboard is, is made uh, quite easily. There's a lot of code here, but you, you'll see that it's, uh, it's pretty obvious everything. So we have a map and we have two layers. On one side, we have the orders. On the other side, we have the distribution centers. So these are two geo data frames. And then uh, you can style, in this case, uh, we are styling by the cluster name. So we, we have a color category style. You can have a color continuous or, or bins, depending on, on your type of variable. Then we added legends. Uh, you can add pop-ups. In this case, we have the cluster name. So if you go through the map and you place the, the pointer here, you get that information. And then we have a lot of widgets. We have formula widgets, like the average distance and category widgets, histogram widgets. So as you can see, you can build a very powerful uh, dashboard or visualization uh, with very easy, easy, easy to use code. 
Okay, so with this, we already have, uh, again, uh, an initial idea. We already uh, identified interesting insights, like the one regarding the difference in, in demand uh, within summer, uh, depending on, on the location. And now we have identified some areas with high concentration of orders that are far from the closest distribution center. And for example, here we can see very large areas of low density with some uh, distribution centers that, well, maybe they, they it makes sense for them to be there or maybe not. So that's uh, what we want to uh, measure now. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, we are gonna build uh, an even more interactive um, dashboard using Cardo frames again. Uh, in which we will uh, build a tool that allows us to add and remove distribution centers and measuring the impact that those uh, decisions uh, have on, on, on the metrics that we decide to, to measure. Um, before we do this, uh, we need to take into account that we are making uh, very impactful decisions in this case, which is should we open or close a distribution center? This is a very costly uh, decision. So this is not an operational decision. This is a decision, a tactical or even a strategic decision. This is uh, something you, a decision you make for the next three, five years. Uh, and normally when you do that, you do that based on some forecast of the demand that you're gonna have for the future. And when you do that forecast, you don't, you don't forecast if you're gonna have uh, uh, an order in a very specific location, uh, but uh, rather you do it um, by aggregating. So in this case, what we're seeing here is the aggregation we're gonna do uh, by using uh, an H3 grid. And the, the important, uh, the, the interesting thing about this is that, well, basically what we're gonna be doing is calculating the average um, number of orders per week per cell. And the interesting thing is that later you can enrich these cells with, uh, with demographics, with points of interest and so forth. And that would help you on building that um, forecasting model for the future. So, uh, just so you know, we're just gonna be using for this uh, exercise uh, historical data because uh, doing that forecast, it's uh, out of scope, but that would be the, the way to go. Okay, so this is the result of the map that we would get uh, when, when um, aggregating the, the orders uh, per cell. Okay, so here what we have is the number, the average number of orders uh, per week. Uh, in this case, we decided to, to use H3, but you could use any other uh, grid, like for example, a quote grid, like you can have here, or maybe for the, for the business case that you're working on, or maybe for your client, it's more interesting to use other aggregation, like for example, uh, zip codes or any other administrative region. So that really depends on the use case that you're working on or any business decision that, it's, uh, that is there, but this would be the way to go. And once we have this aggregated, uh, now what we're gonna be doing is, well, working with this, uh, with this uh, dashboard uh, that allows you to, uh, uh, to remove and add new, new distribution centers. Uh, I'm gonna jump to, to a notebook and do it live, okay? I was using an HTML file uh, just for, to avoid the demo effect, but here uh, we're gonna run, it, run this uh, live as we're using IPy widgets together with Carter frames. And uh, well, we, we need to do this uh, live because otherwise it doesn't work. So um, what we are seeing here is, uh, well, the previous map that we, that we had. So we have all the cells from H3 grid with the average number of orders that they have per week. We have the different distribution centers in red and these lines represent uh, well, if, if this distribution center is uh, delivering to that specific location, okay? We have here some metrics, like for example, what's the operational cost of having all these uh, distribution centers open? We have the average distance and well, we have other metrics, okay? That uh, here you would add all the metrics that you find interesting for, for your business case. Uh, in this case, what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna remove, for example, this distribution center here, which is in Aranda de Duero, uh, to see what the impact on the, on the distance and what we do, and this is thanks to Alpay widgets together with Carter frames. So we say, okay, I want to remove this, um, this distribution center. And right now the assignments that we are making is uh, all based on distance and only distance, okay? Uh, then we'll, we'll see how to, uh, how to go a step forward aggregating other other criteria. And as you can see now, we have a lower operational cost, which makes sense because now we have uh, uh, 
a fewer. We have one one we have removed one of the distribution centers, uh, but the average distance has increased, which makes sense again because uh, well we have uh, removed one distribution center. And then if you remember here we had uh, a very large um, area of concentration of orders, uh, and here for example we might be interested in adding one of these. Uh, distribution centers to see what's the impact, um, just to avoid this uh, area here being far from a distribution center. So this is going to be a little harder because we have to look for this one. So we remove this uh, we, and we look for this one, which is... And there are many cells, so ideally we should filter them by any criteria, but in this case we are considering all of them and this was the one. <clears throat> So again, what we have here is uh, the final result. So again, we removed one distribution center here and we added one here. And we see that the impact is basically that we keep having the same uh, operational cost. But now, uh, if you remember, we started from an average distance of uh, 23.94 uh, kilometers as average, and now we reduced it to 23.66. So, uh, well, uh, this is just one example. The idea here is that, well, you don't need to build some fancy application. You can uh, keep uh, doing this analysis uh, within the within your uh, Jupyter notebook uh, uh, with card of frames together with uh, uh, with HiPy widgets. And we continue with this. Uh, so as I said, on on that um, on that uh, uh, dashboard. Uh, we were only uh, calculating distances, but uh, the truth is that distance is not the only uh, criteria that we normally follow. And in this case, for example, um, well, this, this client was interested in having three criteria into account. The first one was, of course, we want to minimize the average distance, but we also want um, the, the, the utilization of the, of, the, of the distribution centers to be balanced. So we don't want... Uh, we don't want uh, distribution centers to be way above their capacity while others don't, don't reach that capacity they have. And as a, a third criteria, they also had, uh, they also wanted to have, uh, they also wanted to have a, a proportional population covered by each of, of the distribution centers. Okay, so in order to do this, uh, what we do is, uh, well, first we're going, uh, we're going to enrich our data frame and then we build a, uh, a linear uh, optimization model, okay? Uh, so first of all, we are gonna reach our data set with uh, population data, and just as Julia showed you, uh, we can explore the data catalog. In this case, we're using uh, the, the Carter Frames class um, uh, catalog, and in this case, we want uh, to use word pulp data because we know it's uh, public and, and we can have access to, uh, to population, which is what we're looking for. So this is how you do it. You filter by country and by provider, and you get all the data sets. Here on the data sets, uh, you have a very uh, good description of each of, uh, of each of them. And uh, well, basically, the difference between all of them are basically uh, the, the granularity. So we have some, some of them in which the population is given in a 100 meter by 100 meter uh, cells and in the other ones, uh, one kilometer by one kilometer, and then they depend on, on the year. So what you would do here is look for, for the data set that you're interested in, and once you find it, well, we get the, the data set, we get a description, so you can get, this is what we're looking for, so it's a one kilometer resolution, we chose the one kilometer because the cells, the, the IH3 cells are larger than one kilometer, so this is good enough. And uh, well, you can get a, a get a, a glimpse of the of the data set. In this case, it's very it's very simple. We only have population. So, uh, but imagine that you're looking for uh, demographics. You would have a lot of uh, variables here. And of course, we can have the um, description of the variables that uh, Julia already showed you uh, on her example. So I'll, I'm just going to jump to the enrichment part again with the enrichment class. Uh, I just want to add to my initial geo data frame, I, I just want to add a new column with the population of every cell. And this is done very easily with this method, which is called a rich polygons, in which I just indicate my geo data frame, the variable that I want to use, in this case is population. And since 
I know that it's an extensive variable, as Julia explained before. I know that basically it's going to add up all the all the population of the cells within within that one. Since uh, they may not fit perfectly, uh, just so you know, this is done by aerial interpolation. Okay, so uh, once we do this enrichment, uh, we get my initial um, uh, geodata frame with a new column with the population. Okay, so there we have uh, my first criteria for the optimization model. Then uh, the second criteria was regarding uh, the, the distribution center utilization. In this case, this is what we have here. Uh, we have that 100% would be the 100% capacity, and we can see that there are distribution centers that are way above their, uh, their capacity, while some others are even below 50%. And this is something that they didn't like and they wanted to, to improve. So this is something, again, uh, a new criteria that we are going to be adding to our optimization model. Uh, this is basically a map where we can see the, the, the average utilization or saturation of, of the distribution centers uh, in Spain. Okay, and finally, we have the, the optimization model. Uh, here, I'm just going to show you the results. If you're interested in, 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 the, in the linear optimization model, again, you can find it on GitHub. Uh, there's, there's one um, uh, file that is called uh, distribution network optimization, and there you can see, uh, well, you can see the model, how it's modeled. It's, uh, it's again, using linear programming with OR tools. And you can see how how it's done. So it's uh, and just uh, it's, it's very straightforward. It's it's there. So once we solve it, basically what we get is uh, new distribution areas. Okay, so new operational areas. Sorry. So uh, in the end, what we end up with is this uh, map, which is very uh, different from from the one we had at the beginning. Uh, and this would be the result. So based on the current. Uh, distribution centers that they have today, what would be the optimal uh, operational areas, let's say. As next step, uh, which is not covered here, it's out of scope, but uh, would be, okay, now I want the optimization model to decide if I open or close any distribution center to find an even uh, better solution in this case, okay? Uh, just so you, uh, just uh, for you to know, here, for example, we checked the quality of this solution, and we found that, for example, for this first a distribution center, we could reduce its uh, saturation from more than 350% to around 150%, which is good. But for these ones, for example, we weren't able to do it, which may be because we need to give a higher priority to this objective in the objective function, or because basically there's an area in Spain which is saturated, there's a lot of demand, and a new distribution center is needed. Okay, so that would be part of our next uh, approach. And well, as Julia already showed you, you can publish this map, for example, if you're interested in showing it to your client uh, by just using the publish, you give it a name, a password if you want, and uh, you, get, you get the URL. And with this, uh, this would be it. Um, I want to give you time for questions, so just I'm just gonna share this here. Uh, if, you're, yeah, if you're ready to become a special expert, uh, feel free to uh, to request one copy of our Becoming a Special Data Scientist ebook. It's uh, free, so you just uh, can ask for one. And uh, well, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I think we have some time for questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've had quite a few questions throughout the the session already. Um, and I think if anybody wants to carry on those conversations, they can do so on Slack channel. I think you guys covered most of them already. So uh, thank you so much for joining us.